Hello, I'm Richard Quartz, Chief Executive of the British Council for Offices, the BCO, and welcome to this new normal special. Now, those of you who are familiar with the series will know that each week I talk to a prominent member about the coronavirus pandemic and its impact on the office sector. These special interviews are rather different in that we go outside our world and we talk to somebody from outside the membership about the broader context in which property and the office community sit. Now, the focus of this special interview is what we might call diplomacy and international relations. And I'm absolutely delighted that my guest to guide us through the maze is one of Britain's <laughs> most distinguished former diplomats, Sir Christopher Mayer. So welcome, Christopher. Thank you, Richard. It's a pleasure to be here. I have to say I'm too I'm lost in the maze, but I'll do my best to get out of it in the next 15 minutes. <laughs> well, I'm very grateful to you, Christopher, for sparing some time with me and the BCA to talk about these issues. For those who may not know, Sir Christopher served as Britain's ambassador to the United States from 1997 to 2003. And Washington DC is, of course, the top job for any British ambassador and Sir Christopher's tenure coincided with one of the closest periods between the UK and the US since mm. the Second World War. Previously British ambassador to Germany, Sir Christopher was also chief spokesman and press secretary to the former Prime Minister Sir John Major and also chairman of the Press Complaints Commission. Sir Christopher was knighted in 2001 and his memoirs DC Confidential were published in 2005 and very good they are too and I dug out my copy from the shelves behind me and I recommend them to you all no doubt still available on paper. You're a very good man Richard. Well I, I do my best or oh, never never miss the opportunity for a plug. No, very, excellent. Very good they are too. Now welcome again Christopher I'm really very grateful. We'll, we'll jump straight to questions if, if I may and we'll start with the US. Now, the United States is Britain's closest ally, but the strength of the relationship obviously ebbs and flows. How do you think it currently stands? Well, it is in a curious way, in a kind of state of suspense at the moment. And we do know that Donald Trump and Boris Johnson appear to get on pretty well together. Um, although as politicians, they are far more dissimilar than many people think. So, you've got that as a kind of background you've got the continuing very close relationship as there has always been in the fields of defense and intelligence uh, sharing but i think the defining feature um, of the british american relationship during the trump presidency and the boris johnson premiership will be the fate of the free trade negotiations between the us and the uk which are taking place now as a part of Britain's, if you like, sovereign independence after uh, withdrawing from the European Union. Now, people talk a lot about the special relationship and journalists love the phrase because it's an easy way of encapsulating the nature of the relationship. I actually think it's, uh, it is a phrase that has exhausted its usefulness and raises expectations far too high um, on, on either side of the Atlantic, but particularly uh, on this side. And I think that what we're going to see in that negotiation um, is that the special relationship belongs in the rhetorical box over there, over there, but hard negotiation belongs in another box over there, where it will be, as with all countries, a question of finding a sweet spot between the national interests of the two sides. And to be perfectly honest, I, uh, I don't know where this is, is going to come out. I saw that the US Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer had said to a congressional committee the other day um, that if he doesn't get a good deal on agriculture, then there's not going to be an agreement. And I think that it's going to prove to be a very difficult issue. And it may delay a successful negotiation for quite some time. Leave aside the political calendar. Very, very interesting, Christopher. And it, um, the Americans, of course, fight very, very hard on, on trade. There's no, there's no doubt about that. It's going, to be, it's going to be seriously tough, and we'll have to see how it pans out. But an awful lot is, is resting on it. Mr. Trump's been mentioned. We've got to turn to him. Um, now, 
President Trump's victory in 2016 came as a shock to many, I expect to both of us, and not least the Republican Party's establishment. Yeah. Do you think he will be re-elected for a second term this November? Well, I've thought until very recently that he was the favorite to win the presidency in November. Uh, for a number of reasons, the kinds of things that outraged opinion in Europe and uh, for the Democratic Party in the United States, the kinds of things that we uh, in Britain consider to be absolutely outlandish for a president, the bizarre uh, uh, character traits of the president, his extreme narcissism, his, um, how can I put it, lack of familiarity with the truth from time to time, although at the time he obviously believed it. And there are plenty of people around to say, not only is he dishonest, but actually he's a fabulous. He believes everything he says at the time he says it. And he's not the only politician but to be like that. And I thought all these things that you, from a conventional point of view, would say is an utter impediment to his winning again in November, actually in a curious way, uh, turned out to reinforce the, the, the vehemence of his natural base, somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the American uh, uh, voting public, um, and would in the end carry him, carry him to victory. Now, for the first time, I've begun to, begun to wonder whether this is, this is any more the case, because he has just had a really appalling 10 days with all kinds of things uh, going wrong, um, with uh, considerable drain on his popularity ratings. Biden is significantly ahead nationally. One, one, one shouldn't put too much attention on that because I remember that um, Michael Dukakis was 15, 16 points ahead of George W. Bush, uh, George Bush Sr., rather, excuse me, in August of 1988, and in the end, Bush won. Um, but the, from handling of COVID to uh, a whole series of things, some of them are inside the Beltway things like John Bolton's memoirs, which don't do Trump any favors at all. COVID is a, is, is a more widespread thing, but this, this mystery of the Tulsa uh, rally uh, last Saturday, which was supposed to be the beginning, I think, of a, of a, of a real, uh, uh, the election campaign proper as, as, as uh, Trump sees it, was a failure. Two thirds empty, uh, two thirds full only, a third empty. Um, so maybe we are seeing the crumbling um, of the Trump edifice, and maybe Joe Biden can do it. But, uh, you know, I always used to have a rule of thumb, and I still like to stick to it now, if you can stick to a rule of thumb, which is that don't make any bets on the outcome of the presidential election until after Labor Day. And that's the first Monday in September. Then the polls start to really focus on what people want and what people don't want. And then you start to get a really clear idea of wh in which direction the momentum is going. But I'm starting to doubt Trump uh, much more now than I did only a month ago, where I thought that all his odd aberrations were actually reinforcing mechanisms for his popularity in the presidential campaign. Very, very interesting, Christopher. And you mentioned Michael Dukakis, a name you know largely forgotten from the past. And, and I remember that, that campaign well and how he was... He was riding high on the on the Trump rally at the weekend. Absolutely fascinating, and I couldn't agree more. What I thought was really telling were those images of, of Trump getting out of Marine One and, and walking along the the, the, mm. the White House lawn, with which you'll be so familiar, and looking mm. utterly dishevelled and, and dejected. Mm. But he is the most bizarre, the most bizarre figure, isn't he? Utterly. Well, bizarre. I mean, I thought the interesting thing about as, as you say. That, that, that video of him returning from Tulsa, looking utterly dejected and forlorn, it, in a sense, the thing about Trump is he really does wear his heart on his sleeve. And the heart may be a pretty ugly thing for, for, for many people, but it's out there. He, when he's happy, he shows it. Uh, and we've very rarely seen him dejected. Um, and he hasn't allowed himself to look dejected or defeated. But I thought that was a very salient moment. And it may have a very big impression on the consciousness of the, of the voter. I mean, we don't know. Indeed. Very interesting. I'll move on, Christopher, if I may, to what we might call international 
cooperation. Yeah. Now, one consequence of the coronavirus pandemic appears to be the extraordinary absence of international cooperation, perhaps when it was most needed. The EU has acted entirely unlike a union, and the UN has been almost silent. Do you think this is just a temporary blip, or are we seeing the resurgence of the nation state and national self interest? It's a very good question, and I think the answer, the short answer, is more the latter uh, than, than anything else. Uh, I, I remember reading an article by the British philosopher John Gray, um, who occasionally has articles in the New York Review of Books, and he had a very interesting piece at the beginning of the noughties, when we still believe very strongly in multilateralism and international cooperation uh, and uh, all the stuff which Bill Clinton and Tony Blair used to talk about a lot. And one of the things that John Gray said, it was, I think, a really sharp insight was that we look at globalization. We see its impact in financial services in all kinds of econo economic activities. We see it in culture. I think he said you can go to Ulaanbaatar and buy a, uh, a, a T-shirt with Madonna's face on it and all that sort of stuff. But he said the one exception, one exception to this globalization phenomenon was that there was no, what's the right word, homogenization, harmonization of political forms. That as you looked at the nations of the world, apparently living within very porous borders because of globalization, you saw that their political forms and the way in which they chose their leaders um, was still very much within the framework of the traditional nation state. So what was gonna happen? Was the nation state finally gonna melt away or would it always be there? And I think what we have seen, um, and COVID, the COVID pandemic is only the latest example of this, is that so long as the economies are functioning reasonably well and people are reasonably prosperous, then the, the fissures are not visible. As soon as the tide starts to go out, first of all, drastically in 2008, what do you see? People taking cover, running for cover, seeking refuge, inside their national frontiers and sometimes inside nations inside their regional uh, frontiers so the argument was actually the nation state is it has never gone away it's here but sometimes we don't see it and now we have the the two other factors here now we have covid which is a global problem and everyone has rushed for cover inside their nation states including in places like the european union um, and this, and this is my last point, is what we're also seeing when we see the resurgence of the nation states is at least in Europe and in the Western community, the gradual disintegration of the international order put in place above all by the United States um, after the Second World War. So you put all these things together and you've got a long-term trend bolted onto uh, 2008 financial crisis, the COVID crisis uh, of 2020, and indeed, you are seeing nationalism back um, with, 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 a, with a vengeance. And this is why I think there's been such a failure of international cooperation or even European cooperation or Western cooperation in, in tackling the pandemic, except perhaps inside the medical community. Fascinating, fascinating stuff, Christopher. And that sort of retreat home, I mean, as you say, the nation state and then within the nation state, and we can see that in the United Kingdom, and in the varying policies and attitudes towards the pandemic yeah. in England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales. And the fact that we have this sort of devolved responsibility and, and this sort of, you know, these, these in some ways conflicting strategies going on seems utterly bizarre. I think, I think to many, I'd like to switch to Britain, if I may, yeah. for the time that we have remaining now. And you sort of hinted at some of this with sort of the, 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 the global world order post-war and the dominance of the US. But, but Britain has been hugely effective in using what we, we might call soft power, not least through the diplomatic service in the post-war era. Do you think this is still the case? And if not, what does Britain need to do to ensure that it continues to punch ah, the weight? Yes, you, 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 you have touched on a, something which is very dear, dear to my heart here. Um, I think we have been extraordinarily effective, as you say, 
um, in deploying our soft power, which has manifested itself through things like uh, the BBC movies, uh, television program exports, uh, uh, the example of uh, our judicial system. Our, univer our universities have been a great engine of soft power because we've brought in so many, so many people from abroad. Um, the thing that has, I think, the issue here is how do we operate coherently abroad, externally? And I think our soft power, like our hard power, and in hard power, I include uh, economics and trade, we've allowed these things to become detached one from the other. And as a result, the foreign office has become diminished. Now, I think one of the trends over the last 15 years, and I started to see that when I was ambassador, um, is that trade goes off in one direction. International development goes off in another direction. Foreign policy, security policy goes off in another direction. And I remember towards the end of my time in Washington, it must have been in late 2002, um, a British delegation came to DC to discuss Afghanistan. And I, you know, I gave a lunch or a dinner for, for the Brits and um, said to one of the members of the delegation, well, how are things going? He said, the real problem for us in, in Afghanistan is the Department for International Development, DFID, has got one policy, one foreign policy. We, the Foreign Office, got another, and the Ministry of Defense has yet another. And then the army commanders have yet another. And so we, we, we are not coherent. And so this idea about punching above our weight, I hate that phrase. I mean, I think our, our goal should be to punch at our weight, which is considerable. So what we were doing in Afghanistan was punching way below our weight because we were not coherent. Now, I think one of the things that Boris Johnson has spotted, long, and like Foreign Secretary Dominic Raab, that somehow or other, we need to, to get back to coherence in foreign policy. And there are two things that give us hope that this may happen. First of all, the government's announcement that the Department for International Development is gonna be brought back under the Foreign Office, where it used to be. I think in my career, it, went, it was given autonomy twice and was twice brought back, back in again. That'll help, and it'll help financially, and it'll help strategically. And the other thing is we must get our foreign trade and our trade negotiations better coordinated with our foreign policy. That's another strand. And the last strand is whatever it is we decide to do militarily in the world must fit within this strategy. And the second thing, therefore, which I find um, gives hope is the government's announcement before COVID that there would be a root and branch review of national security in the round foreign policy, security policy, defense, development, trade, make them, make them all part of a single coherent strategy. Now, if we can get to that destination, then I think we will enhance not only our hard power, but we will enhance the effectiveness of our soft power. Um, but there's a long way to go to get there. A huge amount there, Christopher, that we could discuss for, for quite some time. I'd love to chat more uh, uh, as well about Britain's sort of post-war status and, and how we've adjusted or haven't adjusted from being a great power to a, to a second tier power and the consequences of all of that and, and, and yeah, so yeah. But sadly, we don't have, have time, but I've just got time, if I may, for one more. Yeah. And I'd like to, to drill down to the government, the current government. And you, you know about this well, because you've been at, at the heart of, of government when you worked for, for John Major when he was prime minister. But, but all governments become unpopular. And the current government will almost certainly enter a period of deep unpopularity in the coming years. Now, spending large sums of money on public services will be part of the agenda. But what more does it need to do? Well, we are clearly about to move on the edge of an economic precipice, which is going to lead to a significant increase in unemployment and, and a sharp recession, whether it's going to be a prolonged recession, I mean, we, we just don't know. I think you get six economists in a room, you get six different, six different views. The essential thing, I mean, let me wind back a bit. Uh, the, gov the size of the government's victory, the, the party's victory in December last year, you know, caught most people on the hop. Uh, and for Boris Johnson to come out with an 81-seat majority um, was, was a striking achievement. 
and he was at that time on the sort of peak, the ever on the peak of the Everest of his popularity. And you knew that that, that couldn't last. But if there was any hubris around, Nemesis came with COVID nineteen, and um, I think every government has tried to tackle COVID nineteen through a process of trial and error. That's the only way to describe it, because since this is a, a virus we have never seen before, um, there is no experience in dealing with it. The only people who've had a natural advantage in this are those who have suffered from SARS and MERS, uh, which were similar, but not, but not the, same, the same viruses. And I think what has happened to this government here in the United Kingdom is it's gone quite rapidly from the peaks of popularity to uh, a moment, which I think we're living through now, where there is significant doubt about its competence. Um, a lot of that is unfair. A lot of that is uh, an alibi for continuing Brexit wars. Those who think that the government has been incompetent tend to be Remainers, and those who give uh, Boris Johnson the benefit of the doubt tend to be Leavers. So the great culture war between the leavers and the remainers didn't stop um, with our withdrawing and didn't stop with the election last year. So we've got a lot of that. And, and you know, it's going to be very hard to get through the coming recession um, and unemployment crisis, maintaining any popularity at all, because sooner or later, um, furlough money is going to stop, all the other things are going to stop, um, and uh, Rishi Sunak, the Chancellor, the only member of the government whose reputation I think has been enhanced over the last few months, um, is going to have to bring in, he won't use the word austerity because it's so toxic now, he's going to have to bring in tightening of some kind which is not going to be popular. I think the key thing in all this, given, given these the strong winds are going to buffet us, as everybody else, is the government must regain and keep a reputation for competence. It may not be popular, it may do things that make people howl and scream, but if there is trust in the most senior minister's ability to do their jobs, um, then I think the centre will hold. If, if, that, if, start, you know, if that erodes more, then I think um, Boris's administration is in, is in serious trouble, um, and I'm not quite sure how that's going to work out. He is lucky in having a chance of the Exchequer, um, who manages to retain both a reputation for competence and, and, a, and a certain popularity. And the fact that he is um, from a, an ethnic minority originally also helps a very great deal in this age of culture wars, I think is the phrase that we, we use now. So it's all to play for. It's all to play for. And relaxing lockdown, I mean, in an hour from now or so, he's going to stand up in the House of Commons and announce the latest relaxation. Um, and there's an awful lot of finger crossing to, to, to hope that this is going to work. I'm sure that's right, Christopher. I mean, I, I think many of us have got the impression that, that having sort of handled it pretty well at, at the start, they're, they're making it up as they go along. Now, I couldn't agree more about Rishi Sunak. I think he's done extraordinarily well, but that reputation for competence is very, very hard to regain. Yeah, I agree. Often we've seen that with, with, with previous governments when they lose grip, where they're seen not to be in, in control. That's really, really hard to get back and, and how the economy will, will pan out. Of course, nobody knows. I, I just must, you'll, you'll probably know this one, but I've always loved it. There was a former a permanent secretary of the treasury who, who reminded, I think it was the select committee, that it's always important to remember that, that treasury forecasts, economic forecasts, lie somewhere between an educated guess and a stab in the dark. And I think we're in, we're in that kind of territory at the moment. No, none of us know how this is. I, I, yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I, think, I think you are. But I, but I think the, one of the areas where the government has failed very badly is it has not communicated well with the public about what, is, what it's doing, what is working, what isn't working. Um, and somebody said that you know, it is, it is promised much, promised too much and, and under delivered and it needs to promise less and, and deliver. And I think a more open and frank uh, uh, communication strategy would be much better and not to over promote things like the Isle of Wight testing of 
the NHS uh, app as if it was you know, manna from heaven and it turns out to be unworkable. I think you're right, Christopher, and you mentioned hubris and, you know, governments can easily be, be found out when they're, they're just overconfident and, and not, you know, paying due deference uh, to, to other factors that are way beyond their control. Sadly, we are out of time. It's been an enormous pleasure, Christopher. I'm very, very grateful to you for spending some time with me. It's been absolutely fascinating. I do hope you've all enjoyed this interview as much as I have. My sincere thanks again to Christopher and to you from watching and from Sir Christopher Mayer and from me. Thank you very much and goodbye. Bye.